All right, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Becky Cox and I'm the CTE coordinator and department chair at Lone Peak High School in Highland, Utah. This webinar is one of a series focused on planning for a COVID-19 impacted school year and we are looking um, and we are looking at a school year through the lens of ACTE's high quality CTE program of study framework. Today's topic is engaging instruction. As programs have moved from the physical classroom to distance learning, we know this has been a challenging topic for teachers because we have heard from many of you about it. As we begin, let me express thanks for the work that each and every one of you has done um, on this webinar has done in keeping our schools open, safe, and as effective as possible during this extremely challenging time. We realize it is a stressful period and we are hopeful that this webinar series will be useful and, support, and a support to you. I would like to thank our panelists for sharing their time and expertise with us today. I will introduce them in one moment, but first a few directions about how we will conduct the meeting and how you can interact with us today. First, you may notice that we are using Zoom webinar, which is different from Zoom meetings ACTE has used in the past. Zoom webinar allows for more participants and has some different features I would like to explain. We will be using the Q&A feature for questions. The mics, participant video, and chat features have all been disabled due to our large crowd. Please type your questions into the Q&A box. I think you'll find this feature um, easy to use and more efficient than the chat feature. We strongly encourage you to share your questions throughout the presentation as our panelists and ACTE staff will be responding during the event. We also encourage you as attendees to share answers to questions as well in, case, um, in cases where you have already discovered solutions or best practices. You can also share any resources that you have in the Q&A box as well. Just, link, um, just type web links and share information as you would in the chat feature. It doesn't have to be in the form of a question. Um, all right. Next, I would like to ask Alicia Haslip, ACTE's Senior Director of Public Policy, to provide a few opening remarks about ACTE's high quality CTE program of study framework, which this webinar and the entire series is built upon. Alicia. Thanks, Becky, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. We hope this webinar will be helpful to you as you begin to plan um, for your classes to resume either this summer or fall. Um, as Becky mentioned, the series of webinars that we're in the midst of is based the elements of ACTE's high quality program of study framework. Um, if you're not familiar with that, I've included on the screen here the 13 elements of the framework. Um, we started with the first 12, of which engaging instruction that we'll talk about today is one of the, the key elements and one where there is a significant amount of impact um, when you think about a COVID-19 impacted school year. And we recently added the system supports element um, that you see at the bottom to cover those broader systems level issues like funding and research that impact CTE as well. Um, as we dig into the engaging instruction element. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about the criteria that are included in the framework to lay a foundation for our conversation today. Um, the engaging instruction element is all about the instructional strategies that are used within a CTE program to create a student-centered learning environment that helps support the student attainment of relevant academic, technical, employability skills. Um, it includes things like project-based learning and other related approaches, um, contextualized instruction and the ability of students to apply skills in authentic scenarios, um, academic integration and connections across coursework are included in this element as well, as are using technology to support learning, um, which is an element on its own but is also highly important when you think about instruction in CTE areas. Um, this element of the framework also includes differentiating instruction and personalizing it to meet the needs of individuals and diverse student populations, as well as managing the educational environment to build a culture of learning and respect all of the um, classroom management techniques um, that educators um, need to master to ensure a successful learning environment. 
many of these elements, um, as you'll hear our panelists talk about today, are impacted greatly by the pandemic. Things like project-based learning and personalized learning and um, building that culture and community within your classroom. So um, we look forward um, to hearing from our panelists on these topics. So I'll turn it back over um, to you, Becky, to introduce them. Perfect. Thank you, Alicia. Um, for those of you not familiar with ACTE's high quality framework, I urge you to take a look um, at the growing number of resources that ACTE has made available on the ACTE website um, at acteonline.org. There really is some, some great resources there. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. We have Celine Braswell um, is the Executive Director of College and Career Readiness and Innovation at Northwest Independent School District in Justin, Texas. We have with us Don um, Tornquist, um, an electives teacher at Baker Webb Academy in Portland, Oregon. And Renee Sigmund is a family and consumer science instructor at Carroll High School in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Welcome to each of you and thank you for joining to share your knowledge and experience with us today. Okay, we have our opening question and um, I think we'll just start um, probably in the order introduced with Celine, then Don, then Renee. Um, so our first question today is, which instructional strategies have been most effective this spring in remote in the remote environment and should continue to be used in blended or remote instruction or even to supplement in-person instruction? Hi, um, Celine's not gonna be, she's gonna be a few minutes late, so I'm just- Oh, that's right, sorry no. about that. Sorry. Um, so for me it's about uh reaching out early in the morning and and pre-teaching my students so the first thing i teach them is um 100 attendance every single day um in a blended school like where i work um we see our students in person every two weeks so they really only have to do two attendances but we don't tell them that so i send out a remind message which is an application built for schools nice and safe and they can respond and when they don't respond I give their parents a phone call, I give them a phone call. Basically, it's whatever works. We start with the text, we have online meetings, we have in-person meetups with social distancing, we do virtual field trips, we do in-person things. So it is whatever it takes to make sure that that student is connecting with you as a teacher, as a classroom, and as a cohort. Thank you. Renee. Hi, okay, so this was definitely very new to us um, once all of this hit. I think Dawn is very experienced in this. Uh, our district took the realm of um, complete remote learning. So uh, we met with our students 45 minutes a period on a daily basis, Monday through Thursday, and then Friday was used for office hours um, and those kind of things. So uh, things that worked well for me, um, in a culinary arts classroom, demonstrations were key. I also have to admit up front that I was very lucky that I had a student teacher and her first day was the first day that we were out of school for real. And so she got quite the experience, um, but demonstrations worked really well. I agree with Dawn, it, it needed to be that personal touch on a daily basis, uh, encouraging students to turn those cameras on, get out of bed, um, you know, we're at school, and um, try to get as focused and active as you can. Uh, those daily emails to students, even emailing during class time, if I notice somebody kind of like not where they needed to be. Um, but the students I think really did enjoy the demos. Uh, we even took those demos um, and developed our own social media, Instagram account, so students could connect with those later. Um, and you know, kids love that avenue and so that was seem to work really well for us that's great you know our school we uh, the actually the day we went out was my last day with a student teacher and unfortunately for, unfortunately for me i didn't have that relationship with my kids i didn't hardly know them at all that made it really difficult i think those personal relationships are so important um, in in connecting this and i'm sure dawn knows how important those are as well um, in her situation um, I, um, I, what was I gonna say? Um, I, um, those, sorry, I lost my, my place here and I've lost my train of thought as well. Um, okay, 
So question number two, um, how, will, how will you work to rebuild a classroom community after significant time away? Don, do you want to take that one first? Um, yeah, I think it's not any different than, than in a, right, we call them brick and mortar classrooms um, where I'm at. So it's not any different than being in a brick and mortar. You set your rules, you do your games, you get the kids engaged because what we have found, um, because we do all of the teaching types, we do synchronous, which is at the same time, we do asynchronous, which is recorded. Um, we do remote learning where the kids don't have any contact with teachers. It's really making sure that they know that they can call you, that they can contact you, and that you're available and that you care. And out of COVID, after we've done all of these surveys, we're finding that that is the key piece. If the kids know that you are still their teacher, you are still going to hold them accountable, you care, you smile, you check to make sure that they have all their basic needs being met, just like in the classroom. Um, we can't give snacks, I mean, obviously, um, but I, I've delivered food boxes to some of my families that are local, um, so you can still be that presence in their life if that is your abilities. Just that's the way you make sure it's still a classroom. I would have to agree with that. I um, I'm lucky in the fact that I do have a two-year Pro Start program, so st I see students typically three years in a row. Uh, although I do have some that are brand new. Um, we work as a team the entire time and that's the whole mindset as you come into my classroom is that you know we need every one of you to make the goals uh to meet the goals and be successful in the classroom um and not one person is better than the other and everybody's opinion is important and and we do a lot of um sharing with that and and team building with that to make sure that everybody feels comfortable to talk to each other um and to to keep that classroom community. Um, we also were able, I think it was very helpful for us. Um, we delivered food boxes and uh, ingredients or had students come pick them up. And I, I, that was one of, I think the best things, one of the hardest things and one of the best things that we did. Uh, we got a lot of parent feedback, you know, hey, we're doing things as a family together. We're cooking whatever your assignment was. And um, we can speak to to that later but just to let them know that yeah this is we're still a community we're in front of a computer now but we still have that human emotion and that human touch and that part is necessary that is that is very important i i totally agree all right as you begin to look ahead to the summer and fall what is the current situation on your campus and in your school slash um state have you reopened to serving any students in person this summer? Have decisions been made about offering in-person, blended, or remote learning for fall semester? Um, in my school, we are, we are completely virtual, with the exceptions I noted earlier, um, until we're in phase three. And the entire state must be in phase three because we are a state our students can come to us from anywhere in the state because it's remote. Um, having said that, the local brick and mortar schools, um, they are working with budget cuts, just like many of you are, um, and they are getting these, these determinations that are changing uh, rapidly, sometimes within the, the course of the same day. Um, and while the students are excited to see their, their peers and their classmates, I don't know if it's feasible because of the cost involved in reopening, and then if there's a spike having to close. So I would say, you know, investing in good quality CTE courses that are designed maybe, so you have something out of the can would be a great plan. Um, and then, you know, coming up, believe it or not, this is gonna be like being a first year teacher, just coming up with projects on the fly based on the needs and the wants of your, of your community. That's what I see. I do not see many of our schools here in Oregon opening a lot. In Indiana, we are in phase three. Um, our directive from our governor has been that all buildings are closed to students through the end of June. Um, as of July 4th, everything is supposed to be open. You know, we have to wait for the, that final word to make sure uh, that that's what it is. We are currently um, in the midst of summer school. And so we offer two sessions, one before the Fourth of July, one after. Uh, the current session of summer school is completely remote. 
Um, and the plan is to do the second session of summer school in the building, um, unless something happens and you know we're starting to see some areas of the country spike a little bit. So we'll see where that leads us. Um, our district and all of the districts in our county have worked really well together with uh, local medical professionals and, and those kind of things before any decision is made. Um, they have those hard conversations uh, with that group of individuals. Um, our district has been um, on top of things, sending out surveys to parents and faculty and staff, you know, just kind of gauging, I guess the fear factor for lack of a better term. Um, what do you feel like is gonna work best? Um, our governor is very much on uh, the thought that we will reopen schools in the fall, but once again, we don't know that. And so I agree with Don, we've got a plan. Um, you know, when this hit in March, we had maybe a week to plan uh, where we close school for a few days so that we can have some staff development and those type things. But um, using this summertime, uh, to be ready to go in the event of whatever happens, I think is really important for all of us. And I think that's what really makes us the most difficult for all of us is that it can change in, in a day's notice as, as we found out even just going out of school, um, it just one day, you know, and didn't even get to say goodbye to kids and things like that. So planning ahead makes it super difficult. I know that I, I teach with some colleagues who are really stressed about it and, and it's just important to just remain as fluid as possible and, and plan for everything, I suppose. Um, okay, question number four. Uh, for in-person instruction, social distancing is likely to change classrooms in many ways. How do you think changes will impact your CTE instruction and how you engage students? My in-person instruction will likely be done more outside when weather permits. The, because we have regional like student centers where our students can go that are built like a classroom, we can have you know four or five students at a time with the, the proper sanitation and social distancing in place and then loop it to another group um, so we can do those things. When it comes to cooking or eating, we don't really have to worry about that. Most cooking can be done um, for our facts class. The students make videos and share those, so it's a community builder that way. Um, and then they do everything. They take pictures, they talk about it, they share, there's Google Classrooms, there's so many different ways. And that that's how we're gonna do the in-person stuff. The best that we can and ask for grace when it doesn't work well. Great. That's funny that you use that term grace because as I was preparing, that was my word in all caps. And I think that we have to show that grace to our students, but to each other, because I think as our students can see, you know, we're teaching in a new format. They're learning in a new format for those of us that are in regular brick and mortar buildings. Um, and so we have to just be upfront with our students. You know, hey, I'm learning right along with you. We're gonna try this today. We're gonna see how it works. Um, and I think when the students see that realness, um, they can buy in a little bit more than, you know, just me on the other end of the computer screen or whatever, uh, talking to them. I'm lucky in the fact I really am lucky in what I do. My students um, fill out an application to be in my program, so they're already there, they're already engaged. But I do have a few introductory classes where they're, you know, they're just checking me out to see if this is the pathway that they want to choose. Um, and so as, as long as I can keep things as normal, whatever that might be for these students as I can, um, check in with them, you know, multiple times through the period, uh, lab work, I, I have a commercial kitchen and a standard fax kitchen. Um, luckily, they're side by side, so I can spread them out, or we can do labs half the group one day, half the group another day. Um, if that's not feasible, um, you know, I mentioned we had we did send ingredients home, so maybe those are some things that we sent home. Ask the students to do some videos back and forth, and and share those in class, and do critiques and those type things, so that we can try to keep it as normal as we can while keeping those students safe. Great. We're excited to have Saloon with us now. Um, she's joined us. She had another meeting that she needed to be at um, up until this point. We've kind of gone through a few questions. Um, Saloon, were you here for question four? Is there anything you want to back up and chat about as well? 
I think I came in at the very tail end of that. I didn't get to hear all of it, but um, I, I will start wherever you'd like. So okay. sorry. <laughs> no, you're totally fine. Let's let's start here then. Um, so we were talking about in-person instruction, that if we go back with some in-person, we're obviously going to have some social distancing issues. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you think that that would impact your CTE instruction and, um, and ha engaging students? You know, for us, it's a couple of things. And oddly enough, the session I was just teaching was on instructional coaching. And so we were talking about how do you change the model? Um, how do you use pairs? Um, for us, uh, just quick cursory background. So 234 square miles, 14 different communities, three different counties. I have three different comprehensive high schools, one accelerated, and then six middle schools. And so sharing teachers across the district and helping teachers team teach with each other and find different ways to do that and have some face-to-face -face and have some virtual at the same time and have a co-teaching model um, is some conversation that we've had. We've had some opportunities to um, talk about what we would ship home. Obviously, you know, the supplies, opportunities, things like that. Uh, we're, a, we're a big supporter if you've ever, if you teach floral design at all, Ben's School of Floral Design does a fabulous job. And this year, their remote learning, actually they shipped all of the product to each one of the, um, the attendees and then there was an online uh, forum that you could get into to watch and so you know lots of different opportunities like that I will tell you that most of my uh, lab based instructors have been filming all summer and putting together groups of films um, working together in different standpoints uh, I, we have strong ag health science and business programs very large programs and so those, uh, there's about nine to 10 teachers in each one of those uh, groups. And so they have worked to put in archived um, videos that they can embed and things of that nature. And so even for social distancing, we're gonna change a little bit of our labs. I've been measuring spaces, trying to look at, um, you know, some of the directives we've been given might be a 22 to one or whatever it may be. Uh, we can build social distancing. What's going to be a struggle is, is are you trying to police behaviors that don't necessarily live outside of the school. Um, we see that all the time when you look at certain dress codes and, and certain things that we try to police. And so making sure that we're not focused on the wrong things is gonna be really important as well. And not focused on um, you know, whether or not two students standing next to each other who live next door to each other in a cul-de-sac and have been around each other since March, you know, am I policing them and saying stand apart? You know, so there's having those mindset conversations is where we're really struggling, not so much on the labs and the instruction. I think more it's the social setting and understanding how we're going to have to learn to operate with each other. You know, that that is a really, really good point because, um, yeah, it, it's just so human nature to, to just connect, especially for these kids to just be connected physically, um, you know, close together. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's going to be yeah, I, I think you're right. It's going to be easy to control in a lab situation, but but that's not all of it. That's not the entirety. I watch it um, with adults. <laughs> I yeah. see with adults now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, the next question is, um, how can you design demonstrations, projects, and group work with social distancing in mind? You know, we, we do focus so much on collaboration, and um, it, 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 it does this is a, a big barrier to that. So how do we help kids overcome that? And we'll start with Dawn. Oh, so we were really excited. Um, our students generally build trebuchets um, in, as part of their courses, but having them all in their different homes throughout the state, we found that they still wanted to do that. So what they did is we opened a discussion board um, in the classroom and we do various modes and different, different types of curriculum. Um, like I teach 16 different preps and I have like six different curriculum that I'm an expert in. Um, but the kids did the trebuchets and they compared their specs and their materials. And a lot of them just did amazing things with what they found in their barns, in their yard, what they can find at their grandparents' house. And then when they came to do the testing, they filmed them with their phones. And um, there was a question actually on how do you, how do you do the, the filming? The, the kids are phones, you know, sometimes we have our, our children film things for us um and then we upload them to the site but they did a phenomenal job some of the trebuchets were you know this big and some of them were eight feet tall and they had a great big open space that they could test them in so i think it's just making sure that you're you're 
the freedom for the students to kind of pick what they want to do, provided it meets some of the specs from the curriculum for scope and sequence, you can be really creative. And when they get the lead for that, they had 25 students participate in that project and probably 22 of them would never have done it if we weren't doing completely virtual learning. So little things like that. I think that's been one of the best things I've seen and and what we've done um, when this all hit we were talking about art and plating as an art and incorporating some art terminology um, into plating design um, and so just on the fly one morning I'm like okay go into your refrigerator or cabinet pull out something you have a term now plate it um, and the creativity was just magnificent because there was nobody looking over their shoulder judging or that kind of thing. It was just what they wanted to do. Um, I think as I, as I think about social distancing and, dim, uh, and doing classwork and that kind of thing, gonna have to do some flipped kind of things wherein maybe I do some demos in class and then they take ingredients home, they do whatever and, and do their videos there. We really, my student teacher was the best help for me. She was a former student of mine and so we already had that relationship. Uh, she got me through how to do the boomerangs and the TikToks and the, all the other little things that this old woman right here didn't necessarily know how to do. Um, and the kids just ate that up. And so uh, we worked with the American Dairy Association. They had a dairy challenge for the month of March. My students had to design, you know, a quick um, snack utilizing dairy. Uh, promote a video, sharing it with somebody else, and, and they enjoy those type of things. And so we're still teaching the concepts and the standards, but we're taking a step back, which is what we really should be doing as a teacher anyway, letting them have some freedom to make choices, how they get to that end product. So I would piggyback off on that, that freedom is definitely really important, especially when we're looking at cultural responsiveness for our students and understanding that all of our students have um, not necessarily the least restrictive environment at home and that our students need um, opportunities to be able to to really engage as well. We're fortunate. Um, the uh, district was able to support us nicely to say um, when when it happened uh, March 9th for us was our date and I had been watching in Washington and some friends that I had there. I was like, oh, it's coming. And so um, we, we pulled the trigger and went ahead and got um, a thousand hotspots immediately, um, set up a call center, started calling, finding out anybody that we knew did not have um, internet and didn't have that capability or the right device in their home. And so the first thing to do is provide accessibility for all of our students. Um, but one of the things that I think was missing was onboarding and helping students who had never had internet in their home and families who had never had that. And so that was a big piece that we needed to make sure. And so that's what we're doing now is actually building some coursework to help students understand the process of how we'll do this. And it's the same with our labs, front loading how we're going to go about the lab work and remote learning. So building learning maps, uh, we use Jim Knight's instructional models of the impact cycle. And so building a learning map for the week and say, okay, here's our learning map. We're gonna chunk this information now where sometimes we might have broken it out, we're gonna chunk it up and we're gonna go through and map out your week. And here's where we're gonna see our peaks and our valleys for the week of, you're gonna have a lab here and maybe there's some Zoom instruction that's working in a synchronous modality. And then maybe here's some lessons that are happening in between. And if you need to be able to, to reach for something that's at home or if you're needing a set of supplies, we, um, if you don't have those things, one of the things we've done is actually, we have an elementary that is our mobile uh, pickup center. And so anything that we want distributed to a student comes to that mobile center and parents know to just drive through and they say the name and it's, you know, it's set up, who's picking it up on what day. And so for us, we had a, a year long, we have a STEM program, an EDD presents class. And so the EDD class is a year long prototyping class. And here they were at May in the, in the thick ready so they could present or in, in March ready to present in May. And so we had a lot of things that had to happen there. And so the students collaborated, they worked together, they already had their teams formed 
uh, because that was the nature of their classroom anyway. And they had that community built, which was great. And so they were able to go ahead and finish out. One of the things, and it was fantastic, we had a virtual conference, um, one day, uh, two days of presentations and finals and judge remote judges from all over the country. And there it was, it was great. But the problem is, is they had six months to really build community in the classroom and had already had this bond. So how do we take and leverage um, knowing that that EDD presents is going to start in August and how are we going to build that bond? So front loading the first part of the year in August in building community. Because if you're going to have that collaboration and you're going to have those labs, you've got to have the community built. Um, and so building those in a remote setting is, it's, it's difficult. And so we're really trying to work on strategies for that. Great. We're going to take a little break from the questions that we had, and we're going to answer some of the questions that our viewers have been sending in. Um, one that we have here is, how do you do team building virtually? Whoever so, wants to pipe in, how's that? So that was a really good question, and that was part of the work that we were looking at is students who don't know each other and they've never worked together, you've just invited them into your home. And so um, self-assessment is really a great place to start into that metacognition piece. And what we're finding in all of the research that we've seen is, you know, using that self-assessment to get to know each other without actually knowing each other's names um, and doing some of those forums that allow for autonomy. I like thought exchange. It's a great place to have autonomy and also ask a driving question and allow people to start learning and talking to each other through thought exchange. Um, and so doing that first and go slow to go fast to build a community. Don't just try to jump right in. It's like, uh, you know, used to, we'd say take two weeks to get to know your students before you ever get into the content. I think that's still kind of a conversation that happens a, little, a lot with people um, and doing a bunch of icebreakers or whatever. And I don't necessarily recommend that, but I recommend getting to know people and to go slow to build the community. And so I think those are some tenants and then just use what resources you have, what's available to you. Great, thanks. Don, any thoughts? Um, yeah, so all of the schools I've ever worked at have always used a homeroom model. So we have one teacher who's responsible for the class building for the majority of, you know, 30 to 35 students. And that's not any different at the school that I work at. I have students that are in kindergarten and I have students that are graduating and headed to college. And I, it's my responsibility to know them and their families and and everything to help them get wherever they want to be in their future. So we, we don't have time to build fast because all of our curriculum for our students is open at the beginning of the term. So it's the additional projects that we're doing. We know how long it's gonna take them to do their assignments in every class. So like Celine was saying, you know, they have the, the peak in the, in the valley of, of what's gonna be for a week. What I found with my son who's in a brick and mortar school is that each teacher had that, but the scope and the scope of all of the classes together combined didn't exist. So there was no crosstalk. Um, mm -hmm. So I would encourage that to happen um, because it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, because we do so much of our curriculum online and our projects are, are different, um, the ability to work you know, at two o'clock in the morning if they work all day is, is a big impact. And just making sure that I answer my, my phone up to, you know, 9.30 p.m. because I have a work phone. Um, it, I think it's just different. So my students, they not only get to know each other, but they get to know me. And so they know, I'm like, hey, no, we're going out to dinner tonight. Don't even try calling. Um, but they get that information eight o'clock every morning. They know I'm sending them a message with that. So part of their class building is they actually check on me if I happen to be running 15 minutes late. It's like, oh no, Mrs. T didn't answer. So it's kind of built in with those expectations and we just kind of do it all with a smile and sometimes we make mistakes. And I love to make spelling errors intentionally because they catch me on them. And then I send in, in the mail a little tiny, hey, nice job on, on catching that. And it doesn't matter how old they are. You just change the little mail to, to meet the, the age group. But those are still the things. I think that no matter what we do for curriculum, no matter what we do for any of this, it's going to come back down to that relationship. If you don't have a relationship with the kiddo, the kiddo's not going to turn out anything for you. 
Right. I think that's the most important concept, finding those commonalities. And even if you have to find those commonalities between a few students before you can connect in a larger group, um, you know, just knowing the kids, knowing how they operate, uh, asking them some leading questions, you know, what, hey, what's great today? You know, even if it's off topic for a little bit, but giving them a chance to shine um, and, and not forgetting that human touch, that's, that's the most important part. And I'll probably keep saying that one. Great. This is another great question. I noticed um, I, I used Canvas. Our, our state pretty much uses Canvas for all of our students. And um, we didn't try to hold live sessions with our classes. And I noticed my kids were online at night. I spent a lot of time, a lot more time at night um, working on class things with them and responding. But this question came in that, how do you address issues of students who are not able to be present in your online class because of needing to babysit their siblings or their work schedule? Um, they're working during the day to help with their family income. Renee, do you wanna start with that one? Sure. Um you know, we did, we were required by our administration to do live uh, uh, lessons, but we also still had everything posted on Canvas. We were strongly encouraged to record all of those um, remote learning sessions so that for that student that did have to work or did have to babysit, or if you've got five or six siblings in a family and your Wi-Fi is not where you need it to be and you have, you know, you cannot get all five of those kids on the computer at one time. You may have to space that out. And so um, just being conscious of the fact that we, once again, that grace board comes up. Okay. I'm going to give you that benefit of the doubt. Uh, I think in order to protect ourselves though, I agree with Dawn, I would answer emails up till like 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> and so I think we have to protect who we are too and let the students know that, Hey, this is when you can reach me unless it's an emergency. I won't respond until this time, uh, but just know that we're here. But um, knowing that we have to be thoughtful about what we're doing with these students and, and let them know that it's okay if you're not gonna be able to get on, but you can find this later. And I do expect you to do that lesson. So holding them accountable for that. Right. So Lynn? I think for us um, in planning moving forward is making sure that whatever we're asking the student to complete and, and experience is of quality and that it really is driving that deeper learning and thinking. And so um, everything needs to have value because it does need to be a valuable lesson instead of doing these small formative assessments and vocabulary quizzes and some of those things that we see sometimes. Um, and a lot of what we saw in emergency remote teaching, I mean, people did the best they could. Um, but now that we know that we're planning for this learning, having opportunities that are um, very enriching, but also know that some students may have to experience it in an asynchronous environment. Some students may have that synchronous opportunity. And then some students are gonna struggle through a next set of supports because of the experiences that are happening outside of, of the school, that the culture of whatever may be happening at the home and now we basically you have three cultures you have the culture of a brick and mortar a culture of an online school and a culture of home and they're all coalescing together for a student possibly in that experience and so really being mindful and responsive there i think it's great to answer emails but also having standard tutorial times having standard office hours those are just good solid practices so that students can reach for something easy and then making sure that you are leveraging your LMSs. You know, do you have forums? Do you have places where they can meet with their peers to get some answers and some conversations going on that doesn't really require the teacher? Great. And Dawn, did you have anything additional to add to that one or? Um, I, I would say that I am that person, that my students um, know me well enough because they get to know me that if they send me a message at two o'clock in the morning when they're working, they know I will respond at 5.30 or 6 a.m. when I wake up and see that message and they just go with it when they're the older students. Um, but, you know, those like those expectations are so, so huge. Um, we also do weekly evening sessions for the students at work. So we have the ability to do that as long as we schedule them. Um, and sometimes we'll host other students from other cohorts, homerooms, uh, families. And it just, we just try to 
in the environment that I work in, um, we did not have the blessings that you guys had to be off for a week to figure things out. We went full board ahead with what we already do and then some. So it this is very much a you're not working an eight hour day. You don't get to go home at the end of the contract hour in this kind of a learning environment. So I hope that you give yourselves grace and you take care of yourselves. Um, but have fun with those kids who are working late because they have some very different experience to bring with you, with them. So it's true. Okay, let's talk about this situation because this is probably going to happen for sure. And honestly, it probably could have been happening even prior to this with students. But when, when you have students who have to remain at home either temporarily or in a blended um, learning model, how can you engage them while the rest of the class is doing the in-person um, class situation? So Salim, we'll start with you. So I think Part of that is, is really making sure that you're using those forum opportunities to write what they're thinking or map out what they're thinking, draw it and upload it. Um, I go back to the learning maps. I think graphical organizers are really powerful and you can do those in a lot of different ways. And so if I am a student who's in a virtual setting and maybe I can't log on to the video during the synchronous instruction with students who are in the classroom, I need to be able to see what's happening, but also maybe contribute in certain ways when I can. And so having that voice honored is the biggest thing. How do you elevate the voice? How do you bring in those, maybe the student responded a day after, and then you're coming back on maybe that Thursday and saying, you know, we had some really great engagement from XYZ and we saw these awesome things and here was something we haven't thought about or whatever, honoring the voice and however it's given honoring um, any type of graphic organizer and how students are posting their thoughts and allowing some of that autonomy from the student, that choice about how they show you the thinking that's happening. I think a lot of people get bogged down into the, did you check A, B, C, D? Instead of saying, how do I know that you are actually learning and engaging with this? Um, and allowing a student to record their own video, be a part of it, you open it up this is where you can leverage digital in a different way and allow students to be elevated in your classroom who maybe before wouldn't have spoken. It's true. Don? We, we do a lot of, we use Canvas as well, and we do a lot of discussions, we do assignment postings, but the one thing that we really do, and, and I do this in my coding class, is they, they, they create a digital portfolio. So they put all of their projects in there and we, they get to pick teams and if they don't pick, we do assign them, but they do peer reviews of those digital portfolios and it's really nice to see the different directions that goes. And I think that you could use, you, you can utilize those in any curriculum that you do. Um, the kids are much better at um, curriculum and, and the, the technology, they, they, they know it. You know, I don't, I don't know how to use TikTok. My kid does, so I could probably learn. You know, the kids are really creative on putting those things and they will create videos to give feedback to the other students or they'll do a quick voice recording. So never underestimate their ability to interact with each other when there's a lot. We use portfolio systems as well. Love it. Right. Renee. I can see um, in lab settings, I think this is an awesome opportunity. You know, our students are one-to-one, -one, so we are pretty lucky in the fact that the students do have that internet connection and, and they're expected to be in class, uh, whether they're in the building or on the computer. Um, I can see this um, for use in my class a lot, especially when we're doing lab skills and learning techniques. And so maybe the person at home is the uh, critiquer, you know, giving the feedback or giving direction. Um, and then doing their own video once they're, you know, once class is over to demonstrate that technique as well. So I can see a lot of, uh, we use a lot of peer feedback in our class anyway, whether it's just talking to each other or writing or whatever it might be, but uh, it gives the students just a little bit different way to look at something and do. Okay. I would, add one, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, was gonna, I would add one more tool is, I go back to self-reflection. We use a professional skills performance review every week for our students. Um, and the students who were really engaged in that prior to the COVID hit never missed a beat. They kept going because they had really owned their learning and were doing a lot of their own self-direction and their choice. Um, and that it's a reflective tool that we use so that the students can actually go through that process of how they're developing as a professional in their classroom. 
and they go through, we have a set of professional skills that we've vetted and we work with our community on, but the students use that too. And so it's a nice way to have that conversation and it's digital. Right. And that's, you know, we don't use that digital format or anything, but that is something that we work on from the beginning. All right. What would I have done? You know, we always reflect back. How, what can I do better? Uh, we can always improve and, and always work on that. One of our, um, one of our participants did ask too, though, if you're in a situation where we're actually recording what's going on in class for a student who's not there, do we have to have any kind of permission slips from parents um, that are of students that are actually in the classroom being recorded? Does anyone know the legal ramifications of that? I know in our district, um, as students register each year, uh, there is a permission form that parents sign. Yes, you can include my students in photo ops, that kind of thing, or no, you may not. And so we get notified if there are any students that are on that list of do not publish. So that probably is a district decision. Okay. We get the same thing for those. One of the things we do try to discourage is the people who take the Brady Bunch screenshot and tweet it out. We're like, please stop doing that. Um, same, same for my school. Um, with the exception that we will go to the extent of re-recording if the recording was valid enough to share and we will re-record and we will share some of the notes without the student names. Um, and part of it is sometimes they come up with just participant numbers when the recording is live. I know Blackboard does that instead of names and that's very helpful. Great. All right. How can you maximize in-person time by moving instruction and at least some demonstration to the remote space? Renee, do you want to start with that one? I think, I think that's one thing that I have found really useful in like learning as I go this spring in how to do this format um, and, and having that student teacher um, if the in-person, moving it to remote, um, I am gonna utilize more of that flipped. Um, I do um, a lot of demonstrations as we've gone through this spring, um, demonstrate those things. Student teacher would end up taking it and making it a shorter little video so that students could access it through Instagram or Canvas um, or wherever, wherever that might be so that they could um, look at it as they're practicing their skill at home. You know, hey, I don't remember exactly how to window pane that yeast bread, and so I'm gonna look at what she did and, and um, see exactly what I'm looking for. So I think that's a great tool for the students because they've always got it there and they can just, you know, start that over. Um, I, I think that has been uh, very helpful for us. Um, and one thing that I'm personally from, you know, we're gonna try to really, um, expand that even if we get back to quote unquote normal settings so that students have more access to that. Great. So Lynn? We, we were actually it was interesting I had filmed one of my teachers earlier in the year because that's what she was doing is she was actually has a YouTube channel that she was floral she had 35 students in a classroom it's really hard to move around and she was like, I can't get to all of them. And so she started going in day before, film the lesson, the actual techniques, load that on her YouTube channel. And then she would in the class do, um, she already had the live demo pieces broken out. And then she would show those benchmarks and just say, okay, let's start here. And they could watch their video the night before, before they came into the lab, they knew what to expect. Um, and then they had, we are a one-to-one -one district. We're very fortunate with our Chromebooks. And the student could have the video with their headphones in while they're doing the flowers and just if they were doing some mimicking of, of those skills as they learn how those techniques work. Um, and then they would come back and do their peer reviews and evaluations uh, for their first levels. And so using that type of model was happening when we were face to face. And so it was a nice transition when we had to go to remote. We had a lot of those pieces. I believe that you can. I also think that at some point we really have to push the envelope to understand academic rigor and technical skills together have to keep moving forward. And a lot of people get bogged down in just the technical techniques. And so they're not getting into that problem solving as much as we'd like. So 
how do we front load the technical techniques and a lot of that um, entry level vocabulary to get over into this problem solving and getting into those sticky conversations of solving these problems. And uh, I, I love to see how we could make it better. So I, I think that although this is not the ideal situation, it is an opportunity for us to all just get better. I think one of the cool things that we added to that was um, the last few weeks of school, it was like, okay, you could see engagement levels, spring break had passed, students are like, you know, eh, I'm done with this, right? Um, and so I designed labs and activities that I'm like, okay, this morning, get up, go to your kitchen, pull out that bag of ingredients. We're all going to cook together. We're all going to complete the lab together. Um, and that was the kids absolutely loved that because I could watch exactly what they were doing. And if they had a question about, you know, all right, how's this supposed to turn out? You know, they might know it, uh, but actually doing it and having the teacher watch that, I think, you know, as it was happening, that was a great experience for them as well. Yep, so because a lot of our, our instruction is online and, and virtual, what we end up doing is we turn the the family visit every two weeks into a flip, flipped, the whole thing is a flipped model. The students, it becomes a student presentation. Okay, show me what you, show me what you learned. And it's not a show me what you did. And it's not a, this is what you, show me what you learned. And they go into such amazing descriptions and details of the things they learned. And it digresses into so many other things. Um, so in the family visits, we can do that because we have different grade levels. Um, I work with a sports team and because they're all in the same age group, we end up having Socratic um, discussions and seminars and the students lead those because they're all in different courses. And so those are really beneficial tools, um, a little easier to do when you're online, but it takes the time for instead of a, hey, this is what we need to do. This is what you did. We're going to talk about it and just kind of keep going up that hierarchy of, of learning because it's important for them to show other people and to teach out. And in some cases, you will find students teaching other students. It's like, oh, hey, I know how to do that. Let's, let's go ahead. Let, let me show you. And so that's been really powerful for us. Thank you. I, I loved what you said about the difference between did and learned. I think that that is so critical in all of this. Learning to just let go of those things that really aren't that essential to our students learning and really focusing on what they can learn and, and apply um, instead of just doing things. I, that is such a great point. We have one last question here and it's long. So um, we will just, I'll, I'll kind of just touch on a few points here and you guys can just um, hit, hit a few parts of this if you prefer. Um, implementing remote learning. There's just a lot of parts of remote learning. Um, how can you clearly communicate and enforce remote classroom norms and expectations, strategies that have worked um, for synchronous remote learning um, or asynchronous? I think for me, the remote learning is a lot harder um, in a synchronous situation. Um, how can learning be personalized in the remote space? Um, how can you apply project-based learning? How can kids practice hands-on skills at home? So there's a lot of parts and pieces to all of that, but just um, just pick a few little things that, that have worked or, or that you could see that would work great for you. And um, Dawn, we'll start with you. I think she said she'd be right back. Oh, did she? Oh, sorry. Hey, here she is. I'm so sorry. I missed the question because, you know, just like when you're teaching um, online, somebody rang my doorbell. Oh. <laughs> and since my door is wide open right now to let some, some fresh air, and my apologies, I, I missed the question. Okay, so it's about remote learning. Um, how do we communicate and enforce remote classroom norms and expectations, strategies that engage students in synchronous learning, um, and, and about asynchronous learning as well? And I mentioned that I think using canvas and things like that asynchronous is pretty easy but the synchronous part is difficult um, how can learning be personalized in a remote space and how do you apply project-based learning um, practice hands-on skills at home I know we've touched on several of these ideas already but any other comments or ideas or thoughts would be great so I you know um in truth, what you what you see right now is not any different than I am with my kids. Um, I, I smile lots. So that makes me happy to see their faces. Um, 
and we we have conversations. Sometimes it's it's correlated, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes you know, I have a student who's really he he is an amazing baker, and he loves to cook, but in his head, he cannot do fractions. So it's like, instead of having those conversations about, you know, let's not focus on what you can do. Hey, show me how you figure out the conversions for the, the recipe that, that you made before I came. Um, and we turn it around and then it's like, by the way, that's called fractions. Um, you're figuring out how to put little pieces of a big thing. And I think part of it, it's just it's grace, smile. You're going to make mistakes. You're never going to be perfect. You're, if you treat the kids online the same way you would in the session, they're going to know you're real. I mean, they are going to know that you are truly, you know, just, just real, just be with them. You're going to cold call kids when they're online. If you think that you, okay, I, okay. 100%, you will know the kids who are on their cell phones. You will know the kids who are not on camera because they turned it on and they walked away because they turned it up. You know this because those are your instincts after being in the classroom. It, it is not any different in that regard. And it's so nice when you can pick up that phone and call that parent and say, you know, I'm pretty sure that Johnny checked out during this class. Can you check with him and have him tell me something he learned? And it never fails that the parent come back and say, I'll get back to you because I know I was not at home and Johnny probably was playing his video game. So those little things, I mean, be nice to yourself and cut yourself some slack. <laughs> if this is going to happen. It's not going to be great all the time. It's not going to be horrid all of the time. You'll have your ups and downs just like in a, in a day in the classroom. Great. Renee? Okay. I, um, this was like the conglomeration question and a lot of different answers here. Um, I think one thing that we're looking at as a district, since we went so strong on synchronous learning, is to take a step back and look at the asynchronous part. Uh, we do utilize Canvas and we are to have, you know, everything on Canvas format, but we tended to find that students were having a hard time finding things because in our role as a teacher and being creative, we wanted our, our pages to look like what we wanted them to look at. So I think in our district, that's one thing that we're going to be working on, you know, uh, and modules are used for this or forums are used for this and so that we can bring a, everything a little bit tighter so that students can navigate things a little bit more easily uh, so that they don't get bogged down with that okay now I'm freaking out because I don't have this assignment done it's due in 15 minutes I can't find it what do I do they're going to close down the test and that kind of thing and so I think that's one of the big things that we have found as a district in this whole process is that we just need to work on that a little bit. I think it's important to continue with the guidelines that you had in class. You know, if you went from brick and mortar and you're now in remote, um, what are those same expectations? You know, my expectations were to be on time and in your seat when that tardy bell rang. Same thing for class, although sometimes we have internet issues and we understand that. Uh, converted my guidelines to your camera's own. Um, you are actively participating. You never know when I'm going to call on you. So you got to be there and you got to be ready. Did I have those students that checked out? Oh yeah, but they would have checked out in the classroom as well. Um, and so Dawn's right when she says, you know, just expect that and be looking for that. You know that that's, that's your teacher instinct. Uh, so those are the big takeaways um, that I've gotten from this. Okay. And so Lynn. I'll, I'll tell two stories. So one is from a student perspective. We had a young man that um, had never self-advocated, uh, ability grouped um, with a student with an IEP, uh, strong spectrum uh, service, and had never actually met that goal in his IEP to be able to self-advocate. And when this happened, um, we couldn't get a hold of him. And it was awesome because all of a sudden we got an email saying, hey, I really didn't want to do any of this stuff you sent me. I was quite unimpressed with what you what you sent, but look what I've been programming and doing and had built this robot and had done all of these things. And he said, I'm respectfully requesting that this go in as my grade uh, because this is what I've been doing. Now, there were a lot of conversations that happened within that, but the extraordinary conversations that were born out of that and understanding this student who was learning to self-advocate was really learning that skill and could show. And, and just like what Don was saying, he, he didn't know how to articulate certain pieces, but he learned a new skill. And 
So being open to how somebody brings the learning to you as well is really, really important. And from a teacher perspective, um, I had an outstanding teacher who uh, said, you know, it's really disappointing that so many of these students were in progress of a certification or they were trying to get to a place that they felt that they were skilled. We have a skilled credential ready model and they wanted their credential. They, they were ready to do it. Um, and then some of them were just kind of in their early stages in some new programming. And so we, we sent out an email uh, two weeks ago and she sent it to every student was in about, oh, probably 10 different courses for our district. And in the first week, she had 95 students sign up to have one-on-one -on -one coaching. And she has had one-on-one -on -one coaching with every one of those students and built them a personalized plan of what they're going to do. They've got a, a goal that they're meeting, what they're going to train for, and where they're going to go, and what day they want to certify. And it's just been really refreshing to see how hungry students are to learn as well. And so no idea, I mean, that idea was born out of a moment of, I think we should do this. And we said, okay, uh, be okay to say, let's try it. The worst you can do is that it's the same set of failures we want in the classroom happen here in the digital world. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, be willing yeah. to do it. You can set any type of norms, whatever works for you in the classroom, try to find a set of norms that work for you in a virtual environment. Um, but just honor the voice of all the children that come to you. Thank you. We do want to thank our panelists for sharing their expertise and ideas about this important issue of engaging instruction. Um, I wish all of you the best as we collectively work to prepare for this um, very interesting 2021 school year um, in whatever form it takes. Please remember that ACTE is always here to serve and support. We hope to see many of you back here as we continue the series um, of, on COVID-19 and the high quality CTE program of study framework through June and July. We also plan to release a guide as a companion to the webinar series, which I believe is truly going to be an amazing tool. We hope to continue to hear from CTE educators, administrators, school counselors, and all other professionals who are working to support students through this difficult time about your successes, challenges, and needs for additional support. Again, thank you to everyone. We appreciate you being here.